Exodus chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. This is the word of God. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God, I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he cast into the sea. And the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep covers them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. And you send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood like a heap. The deeps were congealed. In the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire will be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword, my hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? It's a great verse to memorize. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them up. In your loving kindness, you have let you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants. Of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab trembled. Trembling grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone until your people pass over, O Lord. Until the people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and the horsemen went into the sea. And the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land to the midst of the sea. Miriam prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after with their timbrels and with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he is hurled into the sea. Amen. This far the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word may take that truth and write it upon all our hearts. Let's start with a question tonight question is, why do we ever put words to music? Why do we do that? Well, we, we write things about events, we narrate events, but why do we take those words and adjust them metrically, adjust them lyrically, so that they produce this beautiful music? Why do we do that? There's a whole lot of reasons why we could do this, but the reason that in which that encircles all of them, or perhaps the greatest space of of continual thought, is this. The reason we put words to music or music to our words is that simply that we have been moved mightily by some special experience that we just had. Whether it's the first girl that we met, we write a song, right? Or it's the death of our loved one. 
Perhaps it's some great, another great tragedy. Perhaps it's something that happens in the world that is shocked in awe us. And so what we do is we take those words that we've written and we put it to music because we want how we have been moved to move others. We want to move them. We want them to, be, to, be, to encounter the experience that we have had. We want them to be moved. It happens all the time on the radio. That's, ex- that's the reason why. But there's likely another reason. More than just being moved, there's been, this is, um, we're thinking here tonight, there's likely, it's not just that we've been moved in a certain direction, but that we've been given a whole new perspective on life. Perhaps you've grasped the extent of love, where you thought it was just this great. Now you begin to understand why our Lord calls it the greatest commandment. Not only to love him, but to love one another as ourselves. You begin to see the expansiveness of love. You gain a new perspective. Perhaps you see the world in a new way. Perhaps the Lord has done something great for you that you haven't ever seen before. I'm not a songwriter. (laughs) Um, But I wish I could have written a song when we were given... And answer our prayer for twins. I could have written a song back then. Because in that, I saw the kindness of God in a whole new way. He not only answered our prayers concerning infertility, but he gave us a double blessing. And he didn't have to answer any of that. He never made any sort of promise to me or to my wife. He answered that. And in that, I learned what kindness was. The kindness of God. That he didn't have to give it, but he did it anyway. That moved me. I should have written a song back then. I didn't. But yet, here, what we have in the text is the people of God have been moved by a spectacular situation. A spectacular miracle in which God has led them through on dry land by causing water to stand up on end, cross the Red Sea. And they literally moved. But they were moved by how the hand of God provided for them and delivered them. Because as the enemy came in after them, as they were safely in the shore, God caused all his waters to drop down upon those Egyptians and wipe them out. And they were moved. They didn't just see a great providence and say, wow, God is good in his providence. No, something about it moved them. Like we talked last week, they saw the hand of God moving on their behalf. And so what did they do? What did they do? They picked up, well, Moses and with Miriam, picked up some kind of stylus, right, and started writing on papyri, right? Writing about what God had done. They have seen the Lord act. On their behalf. Has that ever happened to you? Where you have clearly seen how the Lord has provided for you. Perhaps you've been asking him for something. You've been waiting on him for a long time. And then, when you think the hour has long passed for him to answer, then he answers you and you are overwhelmed. And you say, Lord, you did that seen God do that for you? That's what the people are doing here. They've seen the Lord act on their behalf, gaining the new perspective, and they want it to move the next generations. All pointing at this song. Well, what do we see in this hymn? Well, I want to give you, I want to say this hymn is about our title tonight. That the Lord is a warrior. And what I'd like to do tonight is for our first point, I just want to, to present that. And then for our second point, I want to draw, draw out applications. What does this mean for us? So first, the truth, point number one, that the Lord is a warrior. And then number two, the applications from that. So where do we turn here? Well, we turn to verse three. Yes, it is verse one that is repeated by Miriam, which is perhaps the title but the significant development 
of this hymn is verse 3. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And really, we've been looking at the book of Exodus and we've been noticing the Lord wants to make himself known. Right? That's the whole purpose. You have not, you've, as I have revealed myself to the, to the patriarchs before, I have not revealed them as the Lord, the great, and act, the great and mighty one who acts on behalf of his people. The covenant Lord, yes, but the one whose name means I am. And the one who says, I am who I am, or perhaps another translation should be, I am who you will see me to be. I'm going to show myself. I'm going to show you just who the Lord is. And he's been showing us with his mighty acts, the ten plagues, right? All that is under his control. That our God, as we said even this morning, is 100% absolutely sovereign over all things. Absolutely sovereign. There's not a speck of sand nor a black hole, the biggest thing we can think of, right, the greatest mass in the universe, that is out of accord with his will. Everything lines up with what God is working and doing. He is sovereign. And yet, as we move to this psalm, and it's this song, as we would see the waters stand up and then recount this great miracle that God has done, they learn a new perspective about the Lord. What is that? That the Lord is a warrior. What about this hymn is warrior? Warrior like? Well, n- number one, it's a taunt. You taunt your enemies. Do you know how people get ready for war? They start talking about how good they are. You start beating their chest. It, it, it's a common practice. You beat your chest. You say how great you are. How are you going to make mince meat out of your enemy? Ha, ha, ha. We all get excited. Ha, let's go. We're going to kill him, right? But that's boasting of ourselves. What they're boasting in as they are getting ready to enter in as into the wilderness, right, for 40 years, but eventually into Canaan, what they are being taught by Moses and Miriam to boast in is the Lord. To say that the believer's boast is always in the Lord, what he's done. And so they go back and they point to what the Lord has done. What has he done? He's, verse 1, he's thrown the horse and his rider into the sea. I'm just going to recount some of the verses here. Verse 7, and in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. And you send forth your burning anger and it consumes them as chaff. Oh, you can just hear the, the rattles of the people. They're getting their they're, they're sabers and their shields are they're getting together. This is a taunt. First, look, look verse, verse 14. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the, the, the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab trembling grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread has fallen upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone. This is a taunt. Our God is victorious. Get out of our way. You only do that in the context of war, the context of a battle. But also note with me, as this is a taunt or a taunt victory song, it also stresses the action of one. Did you notice that in the reading? No action is given to the people. Not even Moses putting up his staff. Nothing. Nothing. Everything is what the Lord does, right? Verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots chariots, and his army, he, the Lord, cast into the sea. That God cast them. He took them up and put them there. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters, destroys, decimates the enemy. The Lord does this. Verse 8, at the blast of your nostrils, God's, he doesn't even have to do anything but just get angry, right? That, by the way, is the common way that Scripture uh, describes God's anger. His nose got red hot. That's how it describes it. 
And so here, when it says the Lord was angry, it literally, it literally says his nose became red and fumed. And so here, it's, it says this, he's fuming with his enemies, and so he just blows the waters out of the way. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The waters were congealed in the heart of the sea. All this the Lord did. Verse 10, you blew with your wind, the sea covered them. It went back over them. The other way, he blew another way and it blew over them. And they sank like lead in mighty waters. Verse 12, you stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. All of this is action, the action of God alone. He is the one who is doing it. Their taunt, their song is about God and what he has done. More so, the action that God does is war-like. He doesn't just comfort and calm. He is a fighter. He is hurling, verse 1, the horse and its rider into a sea. Horse was a a great military advancement. Why? Speed, force right? Speed, trampling and terrifying the people, riding upon the people, height above them, able to sweep down. It was a tremendous military advancement. And yet the Lord, with his breath or whatever it is, he throws them into the sea. Verse six, more so, it is his right hand, part B, it was his right hand that shatters the enemy. He is coming down and destroying them, pounding them. We see in verse 12 to the verse that we read, it was his right arm, his, the arm of strength that he used and swooped, swooped, swooped down, just destroyed his enemy. It was the Lord. The Lord does military action. But perhaps what brings this all together is, remember what the Lord said back in chapter 14. 14, 14, another great verse to remember. He says very clearly to them while they are saying, oh, we're going to die, we're going to die. That he says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. You're not going to do a thing. I'm going to fight. I am going to fight and I'm going to destroy my enemies. What is this all saying? This is saying that the Lord is a warrior. He's a fighter. And see, it, theologically, we have these categories of God, right? We put up there all those God is statements. So the Lord is, right? The Lord is a consuming fire. We get that from Hebrews, right? The Lord is love. Where do we get that from? First John, right? We learn of all these things that God is, right? But here is a verse that says the Lord is a warrior. He's a fighter. How are we to think of God that way? I mean, in what way do we think of our great God as a fighter? Well, it's fascinating. The word itself is very much akin to what we see today going on at sports games. Have you ever been to a sports game and see a team do a great move and then they start doing this? Have you ever seen that happen? Have you ever seen that? Some of you have seen that happen. You know what that means? They're eating up their enemy. They're just devouring. They're like a bowl of soup. They're just eating right up, right? And that, that's, a, that's a taunt to their enemies. They're doing that. And they get that from all the, the lingo. Fascinating. That's act, they don't, I don't think they know this at all. That's actually the, 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 the action verb behind the Hebrew word fighter. It means to eat up and devour. You can say that to your friend next time you're tying to a sports game, right? You can tell them that. You know, this is from the Bible, this whole idea right here. No, that's not the point here, okay? The, the, the point being is, is what the Lord is doing is he's devouring up his enemy. It's not even work for him. It's actually just feeding him as he does his, as he does. He's nothing for him. It's nothing. Our God is a fighter. This word, the Hebrew word is laham, and it's actually behind the word nephilim. It's the same thought. Those are great fighters, nephilim, same, the same ending there. Fighters, those who are able to eat up our enemies. The Lord does that. And so I I want us to open up our theology a bit and use a biblical term to understand and to grasp 
that our God is like that. And see, young, young people, really young people, you like, young boys like to fight. They do. They like to be warriors, right? They like to show themselves. And we laugh at that. Where do they get that from? It's more than that God puts that in them. It's that, really, that's an image of God. The warrior, those who defend those who stand up for righteousness and justice, those who protect others, where does that come from? That's exactly who God is, who protects the fatherless and the widow. This is our God. He is a warrior. He's the best warrior there ever is. There is none like him. And see, I imagine this is what tripped up I don't know this for certain, but I imagine this is what tripped up those who saw Jesus in his first coming. Because I ima they imagine as they would read the Hebrew scriptures, on the parts of Isaiah 12 and 59 that describe God as this victorious, uh, uh, victorious warrior who comes down with his helmet on for battle, his breastplate of righteousness, sword ready to fight. They were thinking that the Messiah would come at that time, and be the one who just destroys all the enemies of Israel, the nation. And imagine they got tripped up by that. And they didn't read the other portions of the scripture that talked about how Jesus would come the first time as a suffering servant. And they missed the part where they said, no, he's coming for the sequel. He's coming again one day. Jesus, the Gentle and lowly, the, saw, the, the kind one, he's going to come a day, a, day, a day in the future as a warrior. And this is where, where you read from Revelation, right? I'm going to read to you about the one who sits upon the horse, right? In Revelation 19, right? In verse 11. And I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on the horse is called Faithful and True, and right in righteousness he judges and wages wars. His eyes are a flame of fire, and his head, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on them which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Whose robes are dipped in blood? A fighter, a warrior mighty conqueror. And his name is called the word of God. And the, and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean were following him on the white horses. And from his mouth comes a two-edged sword so that he with it may strike down nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and treads the winepress with fierce wrath of God, the almighty and his robe and on his thighs written a name, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It goes on to talk about how he fights the beast, and it's really no battle at all. Do you remember where the beast rises from? From the sea in chapter 13. As if the enemies of God were revived. And now they're rebelling against the Lord, the warrior. And guess what's going to happen? not even a story worth to tell because the enemy is just going to be decimated. It's going to be, phew, they're dead. This is our Lord. He is a warrior. Do you know that? Our Jesus is a warrior. Put that together with this morning's message about all things must submit before him. He is the almighty one. So that's what we see here in this text. But, but point two, I'm just going to bring a couple of conclusions here for application. What does this mean for us? A, this means that we can have peace and comfort. You know, Scripture says that we can cease striving and know that He's God. Know what about Him? That He will fight for you while you keep silent. Oh, the time that we spend fretting. The time that we waste getting so worked up about things our Lord will take care of. How we think that we have to do so much. What did the people do here? Nothing. 
What did God do? Everything. The Lord is a warrior. And we can rest in him that he will fight for us. You know, I, I love that promise that was given to Abraham in seed form that he, that those whom would bless Abraham, God would bless. But those whom would curse Abraham, he would curse. That's a promise. We don't have to be afraid. Because the Lord's going to fight for us. Anyone who's against you, God's against. If you're on his side, if you're on the Lord's side. Anyone who blesses you, they're going to receive a blessing. You know, I, I think of the way that Peter puts this into practice in 1 Peter uh, 3, 7. And he talks about how husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way. And Peter says, or their prayers will be hindered. I mean, it's as if God won't even hear the prayers of the husband who is taking advantage of and, and abusing in very different, in different ways his wife, not living in an understanding way. God's against him. Won't even hear his prayers. And that's just, that's an intimate relationship. How much more so those who with distance are far greater enemies our Lord will fight for us. You know, he says in 1 Peter also that after we've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We don't have to be afraid. Our Lord is a warrior, and he will fight for us. He promises that. We can have peace. You know, next time you're afraid at night, something's terrorizing your soul, Pull up Exodus 14, 14. The Lord is a warrior. Sorry, sorry, how the Lord will fight for us while he keeps silent. Or perhaps Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Say that to yourself. Remind yourself who he is and say, even if I am grumbling and complaining like the Israelites and in the wrong spot, Lord, forgive me. Now, would you protect me? I tell you, I've been there. I've seen myself. I've messed up. I've done the wrong thing. And I know that something terrible is on the horizon. I say, Lord, you don't I don't deserve your help. But would you help me? I'm just a, just a child, one of your children, asking for your help. Would you fight for me? Beloved, he will fight for you. He is the Lord. And the Lord is his name. But also be. You know, I, I think this teaches us how to fight. This really teaches us how to fight. And while I'm doing this, can Ethan, you go to my office here real quick and get a book. I'm sorry I'm calling you. This is probably impromptu. There's a book sitting on my desk. I need to read a quote from here. It's a green book. It's a book that uh, two of us have been reading about Je uh, Jeff Thomas. But when we see the Lord fight and understand how and, and understand that he is a warrior, it teaches us how we are to fight. Thank you, brother. And in two major ways. One, we learn that the strength of our fight is in the Lord. That we trust him. That we rely upon him. That the deliverance that will come to us isn't about our fretting, isn't about our worrying, our Martha, Martha, Martha stuff, right? It isn't all about that. It's about trusting him. Now, I'm not saying inactivity. The people had to walk here. They had to walk through. God called them to do something, right? And that was terrifying. It is seeing the water on both ends. But we should never seek to fight any battle before we're resting in him. We're trusting him. See, the first major work of the battle is to see if your heart is with the Lord. I love that passage, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. These are all kinds of great verses to memory. The eye of the Lord moves to and fro throughout the earth, seeking to strongly support him or her whose heart is completely his. God's looking for his people who are not just on his side, but are trusting. And guess what God wants to do? God wants to fight for those people. And so really, our greatest battle, and this is perhaps why when they go into conquest, 
They do nothing to fight Jericho. Why? Because they wanted them to learn it's not by your swords and about your arms that are going to bring you to victory. It's about your trust. So the question is, are we really trusting? Are we trusting the Lord in this great adventure we're heading off to, to be a warrior? Or are we really trying to do something in the strength of our own might? If God's faithful to you, he's going to humble you and show you that your hand can't work and that you need to learn to trust him. That's the first part. We learn that our strength is in the Lord and how we need to rely upon him. Lord, I trust you. I'll, perhaps your prayer is, Lord, I don't trust you like you should, but I want to want to trust you. Would you do that in me? The Lord starts doing a work in you. But then there's this other part. As we know that our strength is in the Lord, that teaches us how to fight, right? But then, when we understand who the Lord is, we begin to fight like him. How? Well, I, I, I just, I'm just beginning to learn more about the, the, the missionary, the young English cricketer, Cricketer, is that what we say? Cricketeer, something like that. Plays cricket, there it is, whatever. Played cricket, and he did, was on the national scene in England, and yet he left all that to be a missionary in China and then later on in Africa. Stud, C.T. Stud, he later formed Worldwide Evangelist, Evangelization C Company. I don't know what, I don't know what it was. WEC, it's what it, what it, I forget what it was. But he had this thought and found it in this great book, uh, uh, Jeffrey Thomas's his biography, which I've re- picked up again, thanks to encouragement of a friend. And he says, he says, Stud once looked at a group of preachers and missionaries and said to them, let us not glide through this world and then slip quietly into heaven without having blown the trumpet loud and long for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let us see to it that the devil will hold a thanksgiving service in hell when he gets the news that you have left this battlefield. Are we fighting like that for his kingdom? Knowing that we have a warrior who goes before us. Shame on us. But enough of the shame. Repent of the shame. And come to meet this warrior who, who leads in such a way that the gates of hell, that's an advancement term, the gates, the defensive gates, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the advancement of the kingdom of hell. Beloved, we've got to fight. We've got to become warriors. Great, there are people who can pick up a gun and fight with their arms. But can they fight with all their soul strength? You're not a warrior if you can work out and push up 300 pounds and shoot a rifle a certain distance. Great. Hua, you can do that. The greatness is, can you wait upon the Lord? And can you fight for him and do you believe in him? And will you tell this world about him? That is a strong man or woman. The Lord is a warrior. Let's pray. So Lord, we pray that you would continue to conform us more and more to the image of Christ. And and as we're thinking here of the warrior-like nature of Jesus Christ, it isn't to say that we stand up. I didn't give this caveat. That we stand up and seek to decimate people who don't believe in the Jesus and beat them on the head with the Bible. That's not what I'm talking about. No, but to love them and to pray for them. To pray for our enemies. To care for them. To love them when no one else will. And to know that our God goes before us and will defend us as even the enemy comes against us. I love how David meditates on just this fact that the Lord is a warrior in Psalm 3, and he considers that the enemy is rising up against him. Even if 10,000 rise up against him, he will not be afraid. I lay down and slept, and I awoke, 
the Lord sustains us. We can have peace. Lord, help us to fight. Fight with all your strength, resting in you, trusting in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.